It's October 3rd, 2017. You're listening to the Fancy Ramen Podcast. It's November 3rd, 2017. <laughs> You're listening to the Fancy Ramen Podcast. I'm Neil. I'm Cookie. And I'm Scott. And we're giving you a little bit of an early episode because I'm going to be out of town this weekend. Good riddance. Yeah, thank God. Scott had to move us two states away just to get away from me. Is that right? Two states? I, I think that's right. I guess how you chain it. Yeah, two states away. Though you could just, like Wyoming, you could consider is only one state. But it, that's a weird way to do it. If you're one state away, I think that would mean that you are a neighboring state. Oh, okay. Two states away it is then. Damn. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's pretty far considering that we're in the west to midwest where states are enormous and take up a huge amount of space. Texas is the size of like most European countries. It sure is. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, oh, regardless anyways happy halloween guys did you all have fun yeah i had fun uh i did uh some pumpkin carving and that was pretty cool i used a drill to uh carve mine was that the hipster way of doing it now uh no it's just the fast way <laughs> and that's how you do something pretty detailed i think that makes sense that makes sense well i'll be quick since we're we're definitely not intending to take up the whole night recording this uh but i watched a couple movies over halloween and one was called it follows Ooh, tell me about this it's a movie about an stm or a sexually transmitted monster or maybe curse might be more appropriate and the uh, protagonist who gets cursed by it how she copes with it and who else falls victim to the monster or curse so, like, the movie itself is pretty interesting to watch. I won't get into any spoilers. Uh, I mean, I guess technically knowing that it's a sexually transmitted monster is one spoiler, but I don't necessarily think it hurts the movie too much by knowing that beforehand. The movie has this weird aesthetic. It seems to imply that it took place before cell phones, and maybe sometime in like the 80s or 70s. But at, at the same time, like everyone's aesthetic feels more like it came out of like Midwestern America in modern day. So mm. it, it kind of clashes a bit. But when I looked up the director, who is uh, David Robert Mitchell, uh, he, he's known for his, uh, his initial movie, The Myth of the American Sleepover. It very much screams like, oh, I am trying to do like some old throwback style movie. And uh, you, you see that with the, the theatric poster of It Follows as well, which you otherwise don't necessarily get. So I, I'm, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's pretty interesting. And it's definitely uh, an unusual movie in the horror category. So if, if you want something a little different, I'd recommend it. Quick question. How often do you think that uh, a throwback to a previous generation or so in film is because of aesthetic and not because it's easier to buy antiques and use them on set? Like how much of this do you suppose is a uh, result of cost? Mm, that, I think in the general sense, it might be done just to be cost effective a little more likely than we would like to think but in this case i think this guy's just kind of a hipster and wants to you know capitalize on nostalgia for like certain audiences and then other audiences cater to like the cool thing which is like you know i'm gonna wear this teenage mutant ninja turtles t-shirt even though i never watched him as a kid but because it's <laughs> cool to wear old stuff right i can dig it but I also, I'm pretty sure there's a point where if there was a cell phone in the mix, it would have invalidated a certain plot point. On a completely random side note, I was recently reading a uh, R.L. Stein interview where he basically said that the invention of cell phones ruined countless plots or thousands of plots he had for novel ideas. And he, he did the Goosebump series in case you guys are like, savages that don't read goosebumps <laughs> i never read goosebumps but i still know who rl stein is wait 
who's R.L. Stein? Get out of here. Podcast over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Cookie's been booted from the chat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hi, I'm back. <laughs> and, and then the other movie I saw, which was definitely not scary. It might have had a couple few like jump scares to startle viewers, but it's called The Babysitter. It's a Netflix original film that crosses that kick-ass style of movie in with like teen, or in this case, pre-teen horror. Uh, it's about this 12-year-old boy named Cole Johnson who becomes curious about what his babysitter is up to after he goes to sleep. And he ends up witnessing a ritual sacrifice and uh, in that kick-ass sort of style decides to fight back for his house and his life. In the same vein, a lot of the, this, new, like, this new style of film that's catered towards like, a, a younger generation, like the editing is a little hyperactive at times and sometimes a little like jarring because of these quick cuts. But I'm also kind of, I'm, sus- I'm suspecting that, like, I'm also just getting old. And because of that, I'm afraid to go with, like, newer forms of aesthetics or newer forms of uh, editing in this case. So I have a question for you then. Sure. Have you seen the new Runaways trailer? I haven't. Well, you should definitely watch it because it definitely starts off with teenagers witnessing um fuck a uh, ritualistic murder by all their parents so yeah the runaways it's a marvel movie or a series I, I thought it was supposed to be the marvel runaways but it might not be i'm not sure it's on netflix maybe no it looks Who like knows? it is uh is this connected at all to x-men no, because if it's the Marvel Runaways, like, they're actually Runaways. They're not really X-Men, but they're just, like, all the Marvel kids. I, I It just kind of occurred to me that, like, young heroes in Marvel, nine times out of ten, are usually X-Men, right? Yeah, six times out of ten. But, yeah, but they're usually mutants. They are usually mutants. And I guess technically, because they still don't have the rights to X Men, and probably will not, uh, that this the Runaways can like further uh, support like the existence of what do they call it? The subhumans or the metahumans or whatever the shit they needed to use for Civil War. No, no, metahumans are actually in existence. Right, right. Like, that, that's that's the term they're using though, because I remember in uh, Avengers two when they had uh, Scarlet, the Scarlet Witch, and then quicksilver they didn't call them mutants they called them some specific term they did call them metahumans which i find a fallacy considering that those guys are mutants and there are actually people in the series called metahumans like um like in the comic book universes yeah yeah so in the actual comic book universes the x-men leave because the metahuman um cloud was poisoning all the mutants so they all went to the moon or some shit God, I don't comics know. are fucking but either way, stupid we're all nerds. fucking stupid <laughs> i'm sorry i got i got defenses there hey that's fine you gotta you gotta fight for what you like yeah I'll, I'll have to give that a shot oh but speaking of fighting for what i like i threw a party on halloween we just jammed it was fun was that supposed to be a fight for your right to party reference yes yes actually nice all right snaps Actually, I I don't know how to snap right, so maybe I shouldn't have said that. Dude. Now we have to have video of you snapping. Thank you. Well, well, I'll go ahead and produce that soon. But for now, you'll just have that like pathetic audio of what is he trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do have a question for you, real fast, real fast, Scott. Yeah. Have yeah. you gotten to the um Odyssey part of Super Mario Odyssey? Wait, have I gotten to the Odyssey part? What do you mean? Where they're actually singing the song? Oh, uh, yes. I actually just got to it, and I was singing along best as I could. Did you catch I was also my singing little along edit best as in I the could. last episode? I loved your edit. I thought it was so much fun. I was grinning ear to ear when I heard it, and I also realized that I was slightly off on my uh, like tempo, and so I felt a little bad, but not by How the hell much. are you supposed to match your keen <laughs> tempo on a song that's like, yeah, 
I, I don't think there's any reason to judge yourself on that. I don't know, man. I feel like I would have let my honors choir instructor down, but she probably doesn't listen to this podcast, so I'm probably safe. You you let me down. Yeah, see, and that's that's all I can That's bear. when we get an email. When Cookie's got problems, he emails us at podcast at fancyrama.com and really just tears into us. Like this one. Yeah. Yep. Speaking of really tearing into us, Dave me emailed. <laughs> I, I think Scott or I should read this just because you're constantly <laughs> breaking up. You're, yeah, you're getting digitized, man. Oh, no, I'm not going to read it. Cookie's getting downloaded to the oh, cloud. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to read it. And you're pulling all of my audio. <laughs> To me, it sounds like both of you are being downloaded, but you know, it's what I've... We're having some really weird uh, internet issues, and unfortunately, in in order for us to actually record this in time to release it for Neil's departure over this weekend, this is this is what we got. Yep. So, without further ado, um, I'll go ahead and read Dave's email. Legacy contributor Dave writes in, Hello, Raw Human Podcast. Oh, I should also note, actually, before I start this, Dave sent us a really long and well-written and thoughtful email. And because of our limited time and resources, we are going to be truncating this a bit. So um, the edits that we made primarily are just cutting out points that are not as direct as they could be and we can we can go ahead and uh, address it at length later if necessary but back to it hello rod you mean human. we cut out the flavor texts yeah i know we cut out all of the fun writing um we were actually really sad when we had to take out a portion talking about cuphead that that said a game that relies on sacrificing your ceramic bodies in turn to discover boss patterns and strategies Neil was really torn up about that. He almost couldn't hit the strike through key. Like literally almost. Shift, alt, and five is like a strange (laughs) formation for your hand to do. Yeah, I I saw him hesitate. But hello, Raw Human Podcast. Today I type with interest on two particular topics. To begin with, I am curious where everyone is with Cuphead presently. In a recent episode, Neil compares the game's difficulty to a certain contra, an opinion I don't share. With that in mind... When you mentioned the Midnight Shadow game, you expressed disinterest in the mechanic of repeated dying in a trial and error method of problem solving. How does that conflict with your enjoyment of Cuphead? What are your thoughts on games with, without difficulty sliders? And then we'll go ahead and answer here before we move on to the next stage of Dave's email. I mean, uh, well, I guess to answer, I think we're in the second world right now for Cuphead. There's just a lot of games we've been playing, and I think we're stuck on two bosses right now. So second world, we're not even that far, I guess. But uh, what the, the difference between Cuphead and Yomawari is that when you die in Cuphead, it's less than a second before you start the match or the boss battle over. In Yomawari depending on what point you are at the game, you might have to spend another 10 minutes going back to the same point you were just at. And then you may very well just die again because you don't understand the pattern. That totally returns to my complaint in Final Fantasy 3 or 6 or whatever, for instance, where the more you have to work to get back to a boss fight just to try again, the more frustrating and easier it is to kind of give up. And it's like the difference between certain Tony Hawk games where if you had to do a specific trick, but you keep fucking up, like if they start you off with minimal loading back at the same point where you can try the trick again, it's fine. But if you have to go over, like if you have to traverse the the terrain to get back to that point, it makes it ridiculously annoying. Right. Every failure hurts a little worse. You know, Cuphead technically has the easy modes for the bosses. I don't, I've never really come across a game where the difficulty was so, was such a, uh, I guess like a barrier for me to like pass a certain point that I just stopped playing. I, I can't necessarily say I've ever felt negatively about a game without difficulty sliders. At least nothing comes to mind. Like I think Cuphead's perfectly reasonable, especially considering it takes literally seconds to restart a boss run. What about you, Cookie? What ab- 
how far have you gotten in Cuphead and what's your feelings on that? So, you guys are probably not going to hear me and I'm going to sound real digitized, but I just want you to nod your head in agreement, okay? Okay. <laughs> I'm doing it. Perfect. Dave, I haven't gotten any farther than what I did with my wife, so I think like four or five bosses in on the first world. I don't think this game's actually like terribly hard that would make me want to give up. reason I did give up is because there are too many games to play. Um, let's see here. It doesn't really conf conflict with my enjoyment of Cuphead. I actually still think that game is beautiful, and most of the enjoyment I get out of that game really only comes from the aesthetic style of the animation and the art style, the direction it went to. Gameplay-wise, I think it's just okay, but I'm not really much of a die dying in a trial and error method while problem solving type of game person i really just like to you know get through the story and or just shoot people i'm I'm kind of simple that way i'm sorry i can't help you there but now that is the end of my little rant neil scott nod your heads uh -huh. perfect good points <laughs> <laughs> i know i i got most of that yeah i got all of it i thought that was pretty cogent my opinions on games without difficulty sliders, being someone who plays a lot of Dark Souls and games like that, I haven't ever hit anything that's been so difficult I've been unable to complete it. However, even though I really enjoy those types of games, I'm all, I'm all for difficulty sliders. I think if, if a developer wants to add them to create greater accessibility for players, I'm totally comfortable with that. Um, and there are some games that the level of detail in their difficulty sliders as opposed to just sliding from very easy to very hard or an impossible like the ones that let you adjust say certain elements of the game to customize your difficulty i think that is the most amazing thing i wish there were more games that could do that but i understand the limitation behind developing games that allow you to adjust say like the level of enemy color of awareness your skin. and huh? Oh, I said the color of your skin. Oh yeah, exactly. That's important too. Um, I'm I have I have to you know live my life as a pretty plain white guy. Every once in a while, I've got to mix it up. So I need a I need sliders for that, but also like sliders just to uh, have a different experience with either an enemy's level of like aggression or detection in a stealth game but not necessarily that they do an insane amount of damage to me or on the contrary you know i i want to be able to uh play a game in which combat with enemies st strikes really hard but other elements of it aren't necessarily as brutal or, or punishing and so like customizable sliders would be the best thing but I, I am not actually a big opponent to difficulty sliders in general. I didn't even think of Dark Souls or, you know, Bloodborne for that matter. Yeah, new game. I think of New Game Plus and then New Game Plus Plus and then New Game Plus 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 and so on and so forth sort of as a difficulty slider. But the problem is, is if you're having a hard enough time with just New Game as is, there's... Very, there's very little you can do to improve that without like looking up broken builds online. And even then, like that's no promise to being successful. It's just a better advantage. I think the further you go into the new game pluses of Dark Souls, really, it goes away from being like a genuine explorative adventure game more into like, what can I do to maximize my efforts from a stat base? Uh, or it totally basis. becomes a math game. Yeah, min-maxing as best as possible. And, and so like and that that's just another facet of it, which I don't think is necessarily bad. I want to reference something we cut out from his email before, though, which is asking like if it's an issue to have difficulty as, as a barrier to experiencing all of the game's content. And I, I think I would almost just counter that. I think it's it's not necessarily any worse than a game system or a game's like core gameplay serving as a deterrent for some people certain people don't like visual novels or certain people hate rpgs because of that like they might have otherwise or they they might have missed a story that they otherwise would have really resonated because they can't play rpgs or whatever type of game it is so i mean 
That's actually that's a great point. Cookie doesn't like long games, and so he misses out on any game that has like a sixty hour investment to it. I beat Zelda. <laughs> <laughs> Called me out. <laughs> so I guess it's just important to note that like the difficulty of a game has just as much to play as like a, the type of game. So I don't necessarily think like it's bad to have a game that is just difficult in general because that's I think that goes into the game design and the system just as much or just as much. I as appreciate that we live in a world that has YouTube available. So instead of buying Cuphead, I can enjoy all the art by watching every boss fight on YouTube, you yeah. know? I mean, um, one of my coworkers was doing that this morning, so... Yeah, totally. And I actually really enjoyed the experience. Like, if you watch all the boss fights, it's I think it's like an hour of gameplay almost. And so there's really a lot to see and enjoy, um, even though you're not playing the game. And so there are at least ways in which we can overcome the barriers of not being able to play a game because of its difficulty and still enjoy elements of it that were not available back in say the super Nintendo era or previously. Yeah. Uh, moving on from there though, what else? On a completely different note, I'm surprised that you three have taken the news of visceral shutdown with hardly any concern. The podcast also recognized Mike Laidlaw's departure from Bioware, another EA property. I think many would recognize Bioware as making some amazing single-player games like Dragon Age Origins and Mass Effect 2. Also, we should note it's one of Dave's personal faves. But since then, Bioware has made the following, ignoring Old Republic support expansions, Dragon Age 2, Mass Effect 3, Dragon Age Inquisition, Mass Effect Andromeda. At present, we, the public, are only aware of one game that is currently in development under Bioware, Anthem, a multiplayer loot shooter. You cannot tell me this is going to have a rewarding campaign. And Dave, we will not tell you that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Mix that with the increasing appearance of microtransactions that we've seen littered in even the better single-player games over the past few years, and I struggle to see the light at the end of this dark and certainly not dank tunnel. Thanks for making my business travel a little less boring, Dave. All right. So I understand that that might come off a little clumsy, and that's because of the edits that we had to make to fit this in. But um, what do you guys have to say about Dave's thoughts that single player is is taking a little bit of a nosedive? I do, I do, at least from my perspective, understand that there are less single player games that are enticing for me to buy in the last couple of years than were previously when I was younger. Um, However, I've played some really wonderful single-player games that have released, and so I feel by being pickier, I still haven't been deprived of um, too much enjoyment and entertainment in the gaming industry, even though single-player games have definitely changed or become more scarce in quality and quantity. And I think we're like in this weird period of time where i don't necessarily feel like we're suffering because triple or triple a development is not focusing on single player experiences because we still have a handful of studios that do like this year alone we got persona 5 we got near automata which i i wait auto, am i saying i i don't remember like I, automata's I, right okay near automata uh, which I haven't played yet, but I still expect I'll enjoy quite a bit. Uh, we, it is great, yeah. We also got Shadow of War, although that does have the whole uh, microtransaction thing that was brought up. Definitely. Um, what else? Breath of the Wild, mm, Mario Breath Odyssey. Breath of the Wild isn't... Yeah, I I guess uh, it is It is a very good single-player game. I thought maybe he had something about story in here, but maybe not. Okay, yeah. I, I could I could see that being a thing. And then you could argue too that Mario Odyssey maybe doesn't have necessarily like an enriched story that brings out characters no. character but development. Good God, is that is that single player gameplay good? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, maybe we're not seeing a bunch of games come out. Like oh and uh, speaking of which, we still have things like uh Uncharted, um The Last of Us Two. And granted I realize those two games or those two franchises in particular probably only exist because uh of first party funding like those are console sellers 
I don't know. I, I definitely don't feel like we're f- even feeling the effects right now. I feel like the torch has been passed on somewhat to indie games, at least if not, you know, directly. It, it, it's certainly implied, and I understand that if I'm looking for a unique or really engaging experience, I don't necessarily need 40 to 50 hours of, like, really high gra- like high quality graphics and, um, like, really diverse gameplay to enjoy a good single-player game. There's just some awesome indie games that are out there that are worth checking out um, if you want a really strong single-player experience. Absolutely. I, f- I forgot to mention that, that like, this period of time where we still have these great AAA developments, we now also have, like, a plethora of awesome indie games or just smaller team development i mean this year alone we got uh oh god now i'm have to call myself out because i can't recall you're blanking on some stuff i remember for instance um well let's see firewatch came out i really enjoyed hyperlight drifter this year what else do we have i'm just scrolling through my steam right now trying to find all these inside came out oh we got like and now granted these might be more polarizing opinions but i like i played the letter for apparently 53 hours that's a pretty good number (laughs) i played uh gosh what else like heat signature is maybe not like an enriching story but that game is super fun was uh was life is strange this last like this last year sort of like the final episode came out this year right I the uh, the new prequel came the out this did. year. Yeah. yeah, so there, there's stuff around, and like maybe not every other game is is a uh, single player adventure game anymore, or action adventure game, or action RPG. But like, I think that's also partly what was wrong with games over the last ten years. Like, we got so many Assassin's Creeds, we got so many, we we just had this influx influx of games that there were a bunch of mediocre to average games and then you just had a few gems hidden am- uh, amongst them my opinion on it is something has to take a back seat we have couch co-op games back in the ring something has to take a back seat i'm sorry dave <laughs> i need my couch do, co-op do, <laughs> i i don't even think we have couch co-op on a triple a level yet but if that happens which i i don't necessarily think it would we don't but, I'm curious but it's back to see it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's cool. It's good. It's fun. It it's back because because that left for a good 2 years. You could not find a couch co-op game anywhere. In the interest of just progressing, let's talk uh, about Paris Games Week. That's a hot pot. Bang bang. <sighs> so we were real wrong about expecting something from from software cuz nothing no word nada what what do you mean guacamelee 2 that's that's kind of like a <laughs> a from software <laughs> title all right neil go ahead and, and break down break down the games that you think are important here i i'm just gonna mention them all and we can talk about each one in particular if there's any that we feel strongly about uh but we had concrete junk a concrete genie the gardens between ghosts of uh ghosts of tsushima Sh- wait tsushima there we go guacamelee 2 the hong kong massacre which i don't think that was actually a reveal but it was a reveal that it would be exclusive to playstation 4 or i could be pronouncing that wrong and then spelunky 2 which i am probably the most excited about oh are you just talking about like the new new titles yeah specifically the new titles not the ones that we got more information on because we did get to see new info on the last of us 2 uh detroit human uh, becoming human Wait, it's not becoming human, it's become human. Become just human, to, yeah. yeah. I'll, just I'll admit I skipped completely over that because it, it's one of those games where it's like, I know I'm going to buy it, so I don't need to look at it at all. And I am I say that begrudgingly because I have a feeling it's going to be disappointing. Oh, man. But if it, if it lives up to half my expectations, I'm going to enjoy that game a lot, too. Og lives matter. But Spelunky, too. Like, <laughs> I'm way excited about that even though i suck ass at the first game and never beat it that's okay neil that's why you have our silent producer tiffany around right she does all the heavy lifting in games that's the impression i get anymore oh, quite literally in that i just try and i just try to stay up close to her as much as possible so i don't get her killed because she can't see what's at 
the end of the screen. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hong Kong Massacre looks like a uh, hotline or fuck. What the hell is that game called? Heat Signature as well, but it's that top-down shooter style look. Yeah, that's Hotline Miami. Hotline Miami. Thank you. Except there's no bullet time in Hotline Miami. Uh, Guacamole Two, another beat 'em up. Ghosts of uh, Tsushima looks really interesting to me, and as soon as I saw it, I was just like, "Oh, so it's another? It's like a Neo clone? Maybe I mean, is it? I mean, we haven't really seen a lot of gameplay or like confirmed gameplay at this point, but right, it's a game in which it looks like you're going to be fighting people in Japan with swords. So that is a concept I don't think anyone has tried yet. You, you say that, and it doesn't seem like you're as sarcastic as I know you actually are. <laughs> I've been having difficulties recently with new people that I've met not understanding that my tone for sarcasm and my tone for speaking are the exact same. Um, it, it complicates a lot of things when you're when speaking sarcastically is so second nature that it actually doesn't have any discernible difference from how you normally speak. And whose problem is that? I don't think it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, was that sarcastic? Yeah, see that's the whole problem, right? It's not it's not my fault. It's the world that doesn't understand me, Neil. Yep. Yeah, I just looked at uh some of these others though. Uh I really want to know how you pronounce O U R E. The uh the game that's a lot like uh and excuse me, I, it's Ghost of Tsushima. Yeah. Uh, but the game that looks a lot like um, Ori and the Lost Forest. Except now it's just Or. Or. I honest, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's a game. Or? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Cookie, why don't you talk about the latest surprise for Overwatch? Overwatch, uh, short, Ironheart, Reinhardt, Reinhardt got a short. It's actually pretty nice. I liked it. I did not know about um, the hero of Moria, but Scott knows all about that. Is it okay. Moria or is it Moira? It's Moira, just like your... Is Moira? Fav- yeah, like Moira. Just oh, like your Moira. favorite character in Fallout 3. Oh, God. What, you oh, you like mean Moira? Moira? Yeah, I mean Moira, like Moira Brown. Moira. Mm, Moira. Anyway, this, uh, this surprise release of uh, our newest Overwatch hero um, is going to be another support healer, which honestly, I was trying to think about the logic behind bringing in another support healer to the game. And I think that Moira is definitely... I mean... I don't know how much Blizzard has uh, conceptualized when they first released Overwatch on, like, did they have ideas about what they were already doing for, say, um, adding in characters like Doomfist and Sombra and Ana and whatnot? Or did they create these characters as they get a better idea for how the game is working? Because Moira seems like a decision that I would make um, as a developer for Blizzard after encountering sometimes the difficulty of getting someone to play a support healer in Overwatch. Um, I don't know how common that is for particular game types outside of quick play. But I seem to at least experience quite a bit of reluctance, and so I play a lot of support because of it. And her character kit really seems to fall into the category of trying to both satisfy um, the meta's need for a little bit more support healer diversity, which I don't know if you can necessarily say a need, but certainly extra diversity doesn't hurt in this case with uh, the kind of damage dealing abilities that would make a character more appealing to someone who also wants to rack up some eliminations while they're playing the healer role. And so this character Moira is um, a biotic who's able to use healing beams and dark energy to perform like either healing or 
damage and health drain to enemy opponents. She's got orbs that she fires that also are uh, responsive to whether they're fired at... Well, actually, I don't, I don't know if they're responsive to whether they're fired at allies or enemies, but you're able to have quite a bit of diversity with this character with her both dark and light um, kind of... Oh, man, what do I want to say? Duality. And so she seems like she'll be very entertaining for high-level play with both healing and, and scoring a lot of eliminations. And her ultimate ability, I think, will be very effective when paired with snipers who have vision on the map. Uh, Hanzo, and, I think it's Han- Hanzo's Sonic Arrow and Widowmaker's ultimate um, because it sounds like her ultimate can actually pass through walls, which means she could do a, a lot of damage engaging her ultimate from behind a wall with vision, but we'll have to like we'll have to I guess test her out once she officially releases. We as in you and Cookie. Oh yeah, me and Cookie, and that one time we played Overwatch together was actually a lot of fun. We should do that again sometime. Definitely, and it actually went about successfully as we predicted too. We'd be like, "Oh, we're gonna win this one. Oh, we're gonna lose this one." It worked out (laughs) at about that frequency. Uh, Next Sunday, we'll get back to the usual thing, and uh, we'll be talking a little more about Mario Odyssey as well as a few other things. You mean we'll actually have a good podcast? Well, you didn't like this one? Maybe. Oh, I I just think it's really hard when all three of us are remote. And we're having internet connectivity issues. Yeah, that, that's true. And we're true. on a time crunch. Like, my my apologies up front for anything that seems like it's not particularly cohesive or well put together. I, because of my, like, Slack chat issues, wasn't even aware about our recording today until until it was pretty much time to go. So until 45 minutes ago, if you have comments, questions, or corrections, you can write into podcast at fancy And, and if, if you've, you've been, been enjoying, enjoying the show, the- <laughs> 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 well, fine. Take it. Take it, Scott. Take it. <laughs> I'm going to take that one. And then you follow after the comma and then I'll take another bit. All right, go. Okay. And if you've been enjoying the show, and if you've been enjoying the show, leave a review with us on Apple Podcasts. On Apple Podcasts, uh, uh, more, more importantly, tell a friend to help us grow, grow our audience. Our audience. <laughs> and this has been episode thirty-nine of the Fancy Ramen <laughs> Podcast, and absolutely not a train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely not a train wreck, indeed. All right, have a good week, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.